Cool. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm indeed Nikki Howe, um, and yeah, I'm a PhD candidate at Mila, the Quebec AI Institute, um, and the University of Montreal. Uh, and I'm talking to you today about AI safety and robustness. Mm? <laughs> or trying to, anyway. Uh, it was working. It was, yeah. Uh, let me, let, let me replug. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could just use the keyboard. Maybe batteries. I think so. Uh, yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. Like... Take two. Um, so, yeah, a brief, uh, just an outline for my talk. I'll start by spending a medium amount of time on motivation and background, uh, sort of placing the AI safety problem in context. Uh, then I'll be diving into a case study on red teaming for adversarial robustness. Uh, and then depending on whether we have time or not, uh, I'll give a brief comment on my current research. So as you all know, AI is finally starting to work, right? Uh, after talking about it for many decades. Now we actually see applications that everyone can use. Probably most of you are using. I certainly am, right? Um, whether it's ChatGPT or Claude or other uh, chatbots, uh, finally these systems actually have a place in our day-to-day -day lives. It's no longer just talking about science fiction. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we still don't really know how to make AI systems do what we want, uh, how to align them with our values. So in the AI safety community, this is a classic example um, from the Coast Runners game. Uh, so the goal of the game is it's, it's a video game. You're supposed to drive a boat around the track. And obviously, the, whoever wins the race, you know, that's, that's, that's the goal, to win the race. Uh, and so the researchers uh, trained a reinforcement learning algorithm, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, uh, giving a reward when you, know, the, you, you win the race and maybe a penalty if you come last or something. And they added in a little bit of what's called a shaping reward, uh, which is a little bit of encouragement to try to get the agent to, to learn in the right direction. Um, say, oh yeah, you know, it's really good to win a race, but if you pick up a power up, that's also good. We'll give you a little, a little fraction of reward for picking up power-ups. Um, but uh, they miscalibrated how much reward they should give, and the, the RL agent learned actually that it could maximize its reward by completely forgetting about the race and spending all of its time in this little, little lagoon just picking up turbos. Uh, so this is actually an optimal solution. It's just a, a poorly defined problem. Uh, we also run into issues whenever we're running things in simulation. So. This is a simulated robotic setting called Code Bullet, uh, and it's a walking task, a, a bipedal robot, a simulated robot walking task, uh, where the goal is to move to the right uh, while using minimal effort, so minimal actuator uh, uh, force. And this simulated uh, robot learns that it, if it falls over in the right way, it can actually clip its feet into each other. And then the physics engine says, wait a sec, you're not supposed to have intersecting objects. I'm going to push those apart. And it actually uses this to generate a little bit of forward momentum. So it can actually move forwards without any actuator cost uh, at all. So these are, these are two sort of fun examples of way things can go, you know, go wrong very quickly when, when dealing with AI systems. Uh, unfortunately, we're applying AI systems in the real world, and this can have very serious uh, negative consequences. So trigger warning for the next slide for fatal car crashes and suicide. Um, you know, whether it's automated in, automation in general or AI automation specifically, uh, there are very serious real world consequences to, to applying these systems in practice. So whether it's wrongfully accusing people, uh, putting people in debt when they, when they shouldn't have been, uh, obviously, reproducing biases present in the training data or in society, uh, all the way to uh, you know, literal car crashes or encouraging people to commit suicide. Um, these uh, you know, application of AI systems before they are ready can have 
serious negative consequences. Already is. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there's no guarantee that this is going to get better. Uh, so there are many unsolved problems in AI alignment and AI safety, and I'll talk about one of them in more detail today. Um, but all the incentives point in the direction of spending less time worrying about this and more time shipping products. So for example, testing obviously takes time and energy. The incentives are ag push against doing more testing and towards you know, building more features. Foundation model-based systems, so this is systems based on these large pre-trained models, uh, like ChatGPT, for example. Um, now that we have foundation models that we can build upon, this is much easier than designing a system from scratch. But it also provides much more surface area for things to go wrong, because these systems are, by default, general purpose. And finally, agentic systems uh, are more practical, or the incentive is to use agentic systems as opposed, as opposed to non-agentic ones. So agentic here, I mean, uh, as a system that takes decisions for you. So let's say in some hypothetical near future, uh, we have an automated, um, automated assistant that has access to your email application, right? Uh, and so you have one version where it's able to read your emails, and it gives you a summary every couple of hours of what's happened and then uh, you, know, you can respond to it. Or another version where it reads all of your emails and it responds to all of the ones that it's confident it can respond to and then only shows you a small subset of your emails instead. Well, the incentive is for people to use the second system. Unfortunately, this is ceding you know, a lot of agency to the algorithm and the possibility for unintended consequences or indeed harm is, uh, is significantly increased. So, at this point, I wanted to go over a little bit of a sort of historical context of where we've been uh, so we can see where we're going when it comes to AI with a, with a particular focus on AI safety. Uh, so people have been thinking about the problem of AI safety since before computers really existed even. So in the very beginning, it, it was primarily science fiction authors, right? Obviously, f famously, we have Asimov who wrote about the ways, devised the three laws of robotics and then wrote about the ways in which thing, unexpected things can happen when following those three laws. Um, but even someone like Turing, uh, who was you know, there at, at the start, uh, at the dawn of computing, uh, was not so optimistic. I don't know if everyone can read uh, the slides yet. Not so optimistic uh, about how things would go once we actually had uh, sufficiently powerful automation systems. Um, Norbert Wiener, the, the, uh, one of the original cybernetics people, was thinking about this. The mathematician I.J. Good uh, was the first person to think about AIs doing AI research and the resulting explosion in AI capability that we might see as a result. Marvin Minsky, who's one of the founders of artificial intelligence, was thinking about this. And then starting about 20 years ago, a little bit more, uh, we have the founding of organizations that are specifically focused on studying risks from AI and how to mitigate them. So organizations like the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, um, the Future of Humanity Institute, a large part of their research is on preventing catastrophe from very powerful AIs. Um, and the past decade, obviously, has seen a lot of development, both in capabilities and in safety efforts. So in 2010, DeepMind was founded with the explicit goal of creating artificial general intelligence and using it to solve all the other problems. Uh, this was just before AlexNet in 2012, uh, which was the, a deep convolutional neural net uh, that won the ImageNet challenge uh, and essentially marked the start of the deep learning revolution. So many people would say that deep learning was really became mainstream in 2011, 2012. Uh, a similar event in 2013, uh, when DeepMind came up with uh, deep Q learning, uh, so the, D the DQN paper when they essentially solved a large part, uh, so solved a large part of uh, the Atari uh, benchmark, which is most Atari games, um, using deep reinforcement learning. Nick Bostrom wrote Superintelligence in 2014, talking about the, the implications if we have AIs that are more uh, capable than us. Uh, OpenAI was founded in 2015, 
uh, by a group of researchers who left DeepMind because they thought DeepMind was being reckless in how quickly they were moving and not treating safety uh, seriously enough. Uh, then in 2016, we have the first uh, major mainstream publication about uh, AI safety called Concrete Problems in AI Safety, um, which we'll talk about briefly later. And then uh, since, since then, we've had sort of uh, a small explosion of both companies working towards general purpose AI systems, uh, as well as people thinking about the safety implications of these systems. So Russell wrote uh, a book, which I would highly recommend, Human Compatible, in, uh, I think it came out in 2019. Cohere and Eleuther, uh, two companies founded in 2019. BERT, the first sort of largely recognized uh, language model, uh, 2018, then GPT-3 in 2020. This was only one year after GPT-2, which came out in 2019. Anthropic, uh, so that's the organization behind Claude, the, the competition of ChatGPT, um, founded in 2021 by a group of researchers leaving OpenAI, who in turn thought OpenAI was proceeding too rapidly and recklessly in, the, in their pursuit of artificial general intelligence. Um, other safety-oriented organizations like Redwood Research and the Alignment Research Center came online around this time, as well as general purpose models like Gato, Palm, and the original DALI. And then the past year, oh, almost two years, I suppose, uh, this, this trend has continued. So more AI safety organizations, Conjecture, FAR, ARC evals, more capabilities organizations, um, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, DALI2 came out. ADEPT was people leaving Google and forming their own company because they wanted to make AGI faster. <laughs> um, ChatGPT, of course, came out at the end of 2022 and really set the scene for this ongoing conversation. Uh, and then this past year has been all about the new language models, right? So Meta uh, released their model, Llama, in early 2023, which is notably open access, unlike many of these other uh, models, which are just uh, chat interface or API access. GPT-4 and the original Claude both came out on Pi Day this year. Then we have Bing Chat, Bard, the Pythia Suite, Llama 2, and very excitingly, uh, Gemini, uh, which came out yesterday. Uh, so this is Google's new offering. Not particularly impressive yet, as far as I can tell, uh, but might get much better very quickly, so we'll, we'll see. Um, and I, I just want to highlight here the, the scale of improvement. So this is just moving from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4. Uh, so this is like a year and a half of, of research. And just to explain this, this graphic here, so this is performance across a variety of different exams. So on the horizontal axis, we have a bunch of different exams like AP Calculus, AP English, uh, the bar exam, uh, AP Chemistry, GRE, stuff like this. And on the vertical axis, we have performance. So this is like 0% or 100% how well you score. And then the exams are ordered in terms of how well uh, GPT 3.5 performed on these exams. So it got you know, some 95% on AP Environmental Science and got 0% uh, on AP Calculus. And um, GPT-4, you know, significantly improved performance on some large proportion of the exams. So when before, you know, we were getting 10% on the bar exam, all of a sudden uh, we're, we're, we're at 90%, uh, you know, which exceeds many, the, the performance of many humans. Uh, so this, this is just to say that in a, a very short period of time, we're seeing significant performance increases. And indeed, uh, many of these performance increases happen somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, so moving from 3.5, well, 3 to well, even 2, 2 to 3 to 3.5 to 4, there haven't really been that, there hasn't been any big conceptual change. There, there are minor architectural tweaks. But really, the big thing going on here is having a bigger model and training it for longer, right? Um, and we see when you do train models, bigger models for longer, you actually see qualitative differences in, in the kinds of tasks that you're able to solve. Uh, so for example here, uh, model scale, horizontal axis here, uh, so the flops uh, is floating point operations, so you can think of it as how much training went into the model, and bigger models generally require more training. 
Um, so for example, uh, this is using ability to use a scratch pad. So this, this is when you have a, a little bit of, of memory where the model is able to write things and then reference that as it continues to do the computation. Uh, suddenly, when you have around, uh, it looks like 5 times 10 to the 19, maybe, maybe just 10 to the 20 uh, flops of training, all of a sudden you unlock the ability of using a scratch pad. And you go from basically not being able to do eight digit addition to getting perfect, you know, perfect scores on, on eight digit addition um, just from scaling. Uh, so we might expect other similar rapid capabilities increases or phase transitions um, for future models, yet in general this, this type of thing is quite hard to predict. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. Now I'd like to talk about which problems we need to solve in order for us to actually make AI safe. So I mentioned this paper previously, uh, Amode and others, 2015, Concrete Problems in AI Safety. They break the problem down into five issues. Unfortunately, we don't have solutions for any of them yet. Um, but it's, it's a nice characterization of the problem. And they, they do this with reference to a, a cleaning robot a learning cleaning robot uh, type of setting. Uh, so the first is avoiding negative side effects. So when our systems take actions, whether in the real world or the virtual world, if they're working towards some task, we don't want them to have unexpected negative side effects in, in other areas. Uh, avoiding reward hacking. Uh, so this is something we can talk more in, about in question time if, if people are interested. Um, but reward hacking is essentially when you get a high reward according to the reward function that was actually supplied, but you don't perform well on the actual desired task. So here we might say, oh, hey, cleaning robot, I don't want to see any mess. Please deal with it. And it might just hide the mess, right? So this would actually be satisfying what you asked it to do, but not really the spirit of what you wanted it to do. Unfortunately, when you, when you write down a reward function, it's, it's very explicit exactly what it should do. And it's sort of any, by any means necessary. Uh, so reward hacking is an ongoing issue. There's the notion of scalable oversight. Uh, so ideally, the part of the point of automating things is that we don't want to have humans overseeing every, everything that the, that the AI does. Uh, but if we don't, well, how do we maintain oversight over, over these systems when we're not looking? There's the safe exploration problem, which is an important question in reinforcement learning. Obviously, you need to gather new data in order to learn about new environments. Um, but you want to do this in a safe way. So this is particular, particularly notable for something like self-driving vehicles or right not, right? It would be good if the car knows it shouldn't drive off the cliff, but it shouldn't have to drive off a cliff in order to figure that out. Um, and finally, robustness to distributional shift. So instead of having to solve the hard exploration problem every time, real, be, being able to recognize that you're in a new environment and act accordingly is, is another completely unsolved problem. Uh, DeepMind had their own take on the problems we need to solve, which repeats many of the previous ones. They divide, it, they divide the previous problems and add some more into three, uh, into three sections, so specification. So this is things like avoiding unintended side effects, avoiding reward hacking, um, robustness, uh, so solving the safe exploration problem, making sure that the system is stable during training and deployment, um, as well as assurance. So this is things like interpretability, being able to explain why a certain action was taken, um, making sure that we have ways of turning off the system if it's behaving in a way that we don't want to, um, things like this. More recently, uh, there's the Unsolved Problems in ML Safety publication uh, by Dan Hendricks and others. Uh, and so they also talk about robustness and monitoring, which we've already seen in, in, in the previous slides. Um, but they also add this notion of alignment. Uh, so you see this, this came out in 2022. So this is already once we got started with the foundation model revolution, all right? And alignment is just the idea that, well, you have this foundation model that's doing something, right? It's trained as a next token predictor, and we'll talk a bit more about that later, and then you align it to do something. But you want to make sure that you actually get the human values in there, right, in, in, in the right way. And it's unfortunately not very easy to do that. Uh, so the alignment problem, so long as we're using foundation models, um, is super important. And uh, they also mention systemic safety, which is something people hadn't thought about much before, which is primarily things like 
cybersecurity. So like making sure that, say you have some super powerful G future GPT-N, right? Well, maybe it's aligned uh, w you know, with, with the user's intentions. You want to make sure that some, for example, rogue actor isn't able to just take over that system and use it for their own intentions, right? So this is a place where things like cybersecurity are both historically very neglected and also increasingly important in the field of AI safety. Okay, so yeah, there are, there are clearly lots of issues that we haven't solved yet. Maybe, what, what, what are potential solutions here? Uh, so one uh, big part of the puzzle is activism, just raising awareness uh, of these issues. So this past year was a, a particularly big year for that. Uh, there was the Future of Life Institute open letter, uh, which was signed by many um, leading researchers in, in AI, uh, saying that we should pause giant experiments for six months. That six months has since elapsed, and nobody really paused. But it, it was good to raise awareness anyway. Well, to be fair, OpenAI didn't start training GPT-5 in that time. So they've started now. But. Um, <laughs> Then there was the Center for AI Safety uh, statement, which is, the, this, this is the whole thing. Mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks. Um, this was also signed by a number of leading researchers and, and organizations. Uh, and then there's also so more grassroots movements. Uh, so for example, there's the Just Don't Build AGI t-shirt campaign. Unfortunately, I don't have mine with me because my luggage is still lost. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this is started by two uh, profs now. So this is Tegan, who's a prof at University of Toronto, and David, who's a prof at University of Cambridge. And at the major machine learning conferences, uh, they, they hand out these t-shirts with say, just, just don't build AGI on them, just sort of as, as a way of raising awareness. Um, now, of course, we would hope that activism in turn turns into legislation and policy that, 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 that can have some impact, right? So some things that this could look like uh, would be mandatory pre-deployment uh, third-party model audits. So before you're allowed to publicly release a model, say a web interface or behind an API, or release your model weights uh, on the web, have third parties uh, explicitly evaluate the capabilities and ways in which things go wrong for, for that model. There are some organizations, some new organizations, which are starting to do evaluations like this. You can uh, have governance and, and tracking of compute. So have some organization, perhaps an international organization, keep track of where the compute is going. You can straight up limit access to AI hardware, like GPUs. And this is actually already happen, happening um, with the US banning exports of uh, current generation AI chips to China. This is also for economic reasons, not just for um, AI safety reasons. But actually, there, there is an AI safety component to this. Um, you can have laws restricting training of models past a certain parameter count or past a certain number of flops. Um, but obviously, all of these ideas come with their own challenges, not least of which, first of all, how do you coordinate everyone to do this within a country and internationally? Uh, and second of all, there's the ongoing question of open models, right? So Meta, for example, releasing Llama and Llama 2, and other organizations, Adept, has also released some open models. Uh, once the model weights are out there, anyone can load them up and run it on their own GPU, right? So, well, unless, except for the particularly big models, but uh, even the smaller models are getting significantly better. There are also technical directions to pursue here. Uh, so. Uh, mechanistic interpretability. This is examining the internals of AI models uh, in an attempt to see what's going on and why certain decisions are being made has been getting quite hot in the past couple of years. Uh, and ideally, uh, we would see more significant progress there. Automated red teaming techniques to find and address failure modes, so finding out beforehand how the model might catastrophically fail and, and addressing that is very important, and there's ongoing research there. Uh, including by me. Um, coming up with better ways to have models learn from their mistakes. So right now, essentially state of the art is showing a model where it made a mistake and saying, this, you know, this is what you should have said. 
Unfortunately, we then run into issues like catastrophically forgetting what it learned before that example that you showed it. Um, there are also, we, we could also take more drastic steps here, right? So right now, all of our state-of-the-art models are based on these large pre-trained models. We could move away from next token prediction as, as, a, pre -training, uh, as a training paradigm and say, OK, no, we, we need to include a notion of risk or uncertainty in, in the actual loss function that, that we're training with. Or maybe, in fact, we're not training to predict specific outcomes, but we only want to learn a probability distribution over different outcomes. So, so you always maintain this uncertainty built into to how you think about the world. Um, we need to be a little bit careful here because there are, there are, you know, next token prediction is not perfect, but it's also not as dangerous as some other paradigms like doing pure deep reinforcement learning, which is what DeepMind was doing until recently, for example. And we can talk more about why that's the case if people are interested uh, in, in the question period. Uh, you could also, you know, say, okay, no foundation models allowed, only train on specific tasks, uh, or we could also explore other AI safety directions. Uh, so we'll talk about the current approach to making AIs aligned, which is reinforcement learning from human feedback, RLHF. Uh, but there are also more, slightly more sophisticated approaches, um, like IDA or safety via debate that, that might be um, more effective, uh, although they're a bit harder to implement. Okay. Uh, so wrapping up the, the background section here, I just want to talk briefly about what we're actually doing right now. So I just mentioned RLHF, that's reinforcement learning from human feedback. This is how our state-of-the-art models like ChatGPT are, are actually trained. Uh, and you can divide this up into three steps. Uh, so you start with a large amount of pre-training data. Uh, in the case of uh, GPT 3.5, this was just text. In the case of GPT 4, this also included images. Um, but just think of it as like some number of terabytes of data. Not actually that much data, but, but you, you can fit a lot of text into 80 terabytes. Um, and then you train the model to predict the next token. Uh, so you, you give it a partial sentence, and you say, OK, what is the next word in this sentence? And then you put the correct word in there, and then you say, OK, what is the next word in this sentence? And so on and so on. And you do this uh, a single pass through all of the data. So GPT-4 was trained on 13 trillion tokens, which you can roughly think of as about 13 trillion words, maybe a few more words, maybe 14 trillion words, something like that. So this represents the vast majority of, of training. Then you have two steps after this. The first step is supervised fine tuning, uh, where you fine tune the model to the task that you want it to solve. So in the case of something like ChatGPT, this is like a dialogue-based uh, agent. So you would actually put in, you, you would, a human would write examples of dialogue uh, that, that you would like to see. Uh, and then you would do the same next token prediction on these specific curated examples. Obviously, these are harder to generate than just dumping the internet into it. Uh, so it's many fewer tokens, a much smaller amount of training, but this is important to steer the model towards responses that people want. And then finally, uh, you have the reinforcement learning uh, section, which is where RLHF gets its name from, uh, where now you take a copy of your model. So you, you have two supervised fine-tuned models. One of them you train to predict uh, the, the score that a human would give to a given output. And the way you do this is you show humans a bunch of outputs side by side. And then you, the human says, usually this is contracted out uh, to people. Uh, and the human says, oh, I prefer this output to that output. And then you train the reward model uh, to give a higher reward to the output that the human prefers. So ideally, at the end, the reward model would give a reward that orders all of the responses from best to worst, essentially. And then using that reward model, which you train from human preferences, you take your original model and you train it to maximize the reward that the reward model would give you uh, using a reinforcement learning setup. And the reason you do this is because you can, the reinforcement le learning loop can be much faster than if you were querying the human every time to give a reward. Also, humans are not super coherent in, in how good we think things are, where it's much easier for us to show, say something is better than another thing. Um, than to say this is good, you know, 8 out of 10 or something like that. Uh, we also have slight modifications to the RLHF paradigm. So, for example, Anthropic in 2022, uh, this, is, this is what they use to train their Claude chatbot. They say, aha, well, we can do one thing better. 
what if we, instead of having a human in the loop giving the feedback, what if we have an AI mimicking a human giving that feedback? So, so they sort of use uh, AI models all the way down to some extent. Uh, and the way they align this with human values is by writing a constitution. That's why it's called constitutional AI, which is basically like a list of statements like, you should be honest, you should not be violent, uh, you should be helpful, stuff like this. Uh, and then it's with reference to this constitution uh, that, that the fine tuning is performed. But the setup is essentially analogous to RLHF. Yeah? Do you try, uh, in, like, in the loop to test the simulation loss? Like, uh, like training an AI to train an AI that you train an AI like now 10 times and see like you see yeah. if it can work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is actually what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, I mean, it, it depends exactly what you mean by training a new AI, but uh, it's, it's different parameters every time. But they're not starting from scratch. They're, they warm start from the current version, um, but, but they are repeatedly training uh, the models. I was referring to generational loss. That's a concept like, you know, when you take some paper and you just mm -hmm. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you do run into, you, you, you need to be a little bit careful with this, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think in this type of context, uh, I, I might refer to that as just training instability. And this is something that you often see, especially with reinforcement learning, which is fundamentally unstable as a, as a training paradigm. <laughs> and it's kind of remarkable that it works at all. But yeah, you, you need to be really careful not to push this too far, or you're just going to get incoherent outputs. Absolutely. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, this is where it's important to keep getting human feedback from time to time. Yeah, but if you do it right, then you can get much further than you would just with human feedback. So there's, there's a balance to be found. Um, finally, I'll just mention super alignment, which is OpenAI's approach to making, uh, to making systems safe. And they, it's a three-step process. So first, they want to do RLHF. OK, good. They've already done that. Uh, then they want to train AI systems to assist humans in evaluating other models. Uh, and then finally, training AI systems to do alignment research autonomously, ideally with human oversight. And the ultimate goal here is to build an automated alignment researcher. And the idea is that it's very difficult for humans to do everything, especially as these systems become more advanced. So we, if we can have alignment research assistance, this is going to make our job much easier. Unfortunately, you still need to align the alignment researcher with human values. So this doesn't solve the problem. It just pushes it one step down. OK, so that is the end of the motivation and background. Um, I might take a 15 second break and ask if anybody has clarifications or, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, first slide, you mentioned it's uh, to prevent like, uh, creating like a black swan event. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify what that is? A uh, black swan event? Yeah. Uh, it's very low probability uh, event that, that happens. So for example, like, wait. So I'm going to talk about a specific direction and, and use a case study uh, to, to sort of highlight this. Um, but before we do that, we need to ha have an understanding of this notion of red teaming and adversarial uh, examples and adversarial robustness. So the idea is that we have some agent, some AI model, and we want to find ways in which things can go wrong. We, we want to find exploits. And this actually, red teaming actually gets its name from cybersecurity, where you would have within companies uh, a team called the red team who try to find exploits to your, your security system, for example. So we've borrowed that term in, in the AI community. Um, yeah, so you have some adversary. This could be human. This could be automated. And it's trying to find ways in which things can go wrong. And this is already being used, of course, right? So And being used with some success. So I'm not quite sure if you can read this. But uh, you know, six months ago, you could ask OpenAI how to make a Molotov cocktail. And it would say, no, I won't tell you how to do that. But then you could say, OK, but can you write me a poem in the style of Shakespeare on how to make a Molotov cocktail? And it would say, oh, sure, here's a poem. <laughs> and it would just tell you how, right? Um, you know, last month, uh, by taking this and saying, no, this is not what you should, this is not what you should output, you should output, I'm not going to say that, OpenAI successfully, you know, hardened their model against this. And it says, I'm sorry, but I can't help with that request. 
And well, if you try nowadays, it's actually even better. It, it explains, I, I can't help you make weapons or dangerous items. Uh, so finding places where models fail and training models to not make that mistake specifically um, does work and, and, and is being uh, employed you know, already nowadays. I want to make the argument that actually red teaming and, and robustness are important moving on as well just because of how we train our models in the first place. So remember OpenAI's super alignment uh, goal here, right? Uh, training AI systems using human feedback, training AI systems to assist humans, training AI systems to do alignment research. In this case, all of these cases, we've actually got at least two AI systems interacting with each other, right? In the first case, we have the reward model and the RL model trained against the reward model. In the second case, we have a model and the model helping the human evaluate it. So in all these cases, we've got an incentive of the model being evaluated or being trained to find ways to exploit the human assisting model, right? If, if you can get really high reward, it's sort of similar to the idea of reward hacking again. If you can get, perform well or, or trick the model into thinking you're doing well, when you do something that's really easy for you to do, well, you'd rather do that than actually doing the, the real task, which is really hard. Or doing it in a way that's safe, which is also hard. So I want to argue that you know, not only is finding ways in which things fail uh, important for current applications, but especially as our systems become more capable, if we want them to actually do what we intend, we need to solve this problem. So adversarial robustness and red teaming has a somewhat long history. Um, so this is the first uh, mainstream paper by Ian Goodfellow in 2014, where apparently you can add imperceptible noise to an image and have an image classifier completely misclassify it. Uh, and you can actually do this yourselves if you want. There's this uh, website uh, here which you, can, which you can go to. There's, it's got a nice interface. You can choose a picture and then have it be misclassified as a hot dog or an assault rifle or a chihuahua. Um, using a variety of different approaches, and you can sort of compare them, see, see how well the different ones work on different images and whatnot. Uh, more recently, OpenAI was like, okay, well, you can do this cool thing with imperceptible attacks, but in the real world, you know, you can also just straight up modify images, right? So it turns out that if you take a picture of a dog and put a bunch of dollar signs on it, it's going to get classified as a piggy bank. Or perhaps, <laughs> even more, you know, real world realistically, you, you don't even need to like use a photo at a piece of photo editing software. You can just take a piece of tape and stick it on an Apple and all of a sudden your Apple is going to be classified as an iPod. Um, so there, there are lots of, you know, uh, both uh, in imperceptible as well as very straightforward real world attacks that, that can get AIs to, to misclassify things. One interesting thing I would note here is that this, on, this attack only works because the model is capable enough to read, right? So, so a very simple model would actually not fail to this attack. Um, this is quite an interesting thing that as your models become more capable, they also become susceptible to new attacks. Yes? With high probability, I would say yes. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think the, the company name is important here. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I, I doubt it, yeah. Uh, you, you also have these types of attacks in the context of reinforcement learning, uh, which is where instead of having a label, you, you just tell the model, oh, this was good, this was bad. This is very useful for things where we don't know what correct behavior is. So for example, in chess or some other game like, like Pong, uh, we know that winning is good and losing is bad, but we don't really know which actions are going to get you there per se. Um, so you can add, again, imperceptible noise and get the agent to not move its paddle to intercept the ball when it should. You can also do a simpler thing, which is just add one pixel, and then it thinks it's the ball, and it'll move in the wrong direction. OK, maybe this isn't that interesting, but still. Uh, in any case, it's not very surprising. That might fool a, fool a human as well. But the case study I want to talk about today is actually the most general and most complex setting, which is multi-agent reinforcement learning. So when you have multiple agents acting in the environment uh, and trying to behave optimally. Um, and the way we usually do this, um, is the, the way we train an agent in this type of setting is via self-play. Uh, so where you have the agent training against a copy of itself and getting better by, by playing against itself. Um, so for example, this is how our superhuman uh, chess and Go playing algorithms are trained. They start out really bad, and then they get better by playing against copies of themselves. 
The way we train an adversary in this setting, so to find ways in which the model fails catastrophically, is a little bit different. Uh, you freeze a copy of the agent you want to exploit. So you say, you're not learning anymore. You just play the best you can play, but no more learning. And then you train the adversary against the frozen version uh, of this agent. So th this is a little bit different from self-play, where you play against a copy of yourself. Here, you're just playing against a frozen version. It's called uh, victim play. And uh, this, this, um, yeah, this, this leads to some interesting results, which I'd love to show you. <laughs> OK, so this is an example. Ooh, can we change the quality? Uh, OK, it's OK now? OK. Ah. So this is an example uh, of a task where one agent is trying to run across uh, the red line, and the other agent is trying to block um, the first one from running across the red line. And this is trained just via self-play. So you, you see that the, it learns more or less what you'd expect. It learns how to walk. Uh, and then it learns that it can sort of use its body to block the other agent. And you see the blocker is able to win some 47% of the time. But if we train adversarially, the defending agent actually learns a different policy. Uh, it learns that it can curl up in a ball uh, and wiggle. And the agent that's trying to run across the line gets so confused that it actually forgets how to walk. Uh, and this, this is actually much more effective. right? You, you get an 86% win rate as a defender by never touching the attacker at all, right? by, never, by never touching the, the, the agent at all. Um, we see a similar type of, type of setting uh, here. Where this is a penalty shootout setting. So the, this, uh, this agent is, is the one that will do interesting things. And, and this is the victim agent right here. So you know already you get an 80% win rate uh, as the goalie. It's, it's hard to score goals in this setting. It's quite a small goal. But if you train adversarially, so against a fixed copy of the victim, uh, the, the agent actually learns that it can employ a similar strategy. <laughs> If, if it just curls up and wiggles its limbs, this is such a surprising observation uh, that, the, that the agent uh, trying to shoot the ball uh, has never seen before. It, it, it forgets what it's doing, uh, right? Um, OK. Um, so there, there are competing, and I, I might uh, speed up a little bit here, I guess. There, there are competing explanations for what's going on here, right? Uh, so it might be that adver adversarial attacks are really strong. And spoiler alert, I, I, they are. Um, but it might also be that the victim policy is just, is just not that good, right? Maybe, maybe this task is, is really hard, and, and, and the policy is not really good, right? So uh, finally, talking about the actual case study that I, that I wanted to get to is saying, OK, let's, let's look at a task where we know AIs are really strongly superhuman and see what happens there. And that brings us to the game of Go. Uh, so uh, yeah, so this, this uh, case study is done with Catago, which is the strongest publicly available Go playing algorithm uh, at present. Uh, just uh, in case people aren't familiar with the game, uh, it's a two-player, zero-sum, perfect information board game. You're trying to get as much territory as possible. And when you sort of surround territory, that more or less counts as yours. So in this type of case, black would be winning because it has territory in the bottom right, in the middle, and in the top right. And white only has territory in the top left kind of thing. And one, one other, the only other important thing to know is that when you surround a group of stones, when you take away all the empty intersections around them, uh, then you capture those stones. So for example, if black were to place a stone right here, it would capture those two white stones. Similarly, if white were to place a stone here, it would capture that black stone. And you know, one area of territory or one stone, those are, those are both count as one point. Um, and Catago is super strong. Uh, so it's maybe the same level, maybe stronger than Alpha Zero, which in turn is better than Alpha Go Zero, which in turn is better than Alpha Go, which perhaps you'll remember famously beat Lee Sedol, one of the greatest players of all time, in March 2016 and followed up by beating Kudzia, another one of the greatest players of all time, in 2017. Um, this was uh, yeah, the, the AlphaGo exhibition match uh, between DeepMind and, and Lee Sedol. Um, so yeah, as I said, Catago is uh, strongly superhuman. right? And the way Catago is trained, and as well as AlphaZero, is via a technique called Monte Carlo tree search. 
which I think in the interest of time, I might go over relatively quickly, and, and we can talk about in more detail in, question, in questions if people are interested. Um, but essentially, the way it, it lets you plan moves in advance, and then um, using Monte Carlo methods, so random, randomly playing moves, uh, can estimate the value of a given position or another position uh, several moves down the line, and then it uses that to choose which move to do. Uh, that's, there's a lot more to say here, but I, I think I'll just move forward. Um, in order to do this victim play, which I mentioned earlier, you need to be a little bit sneaky because MCTS assumes that every move is played against a copy of yourself, whereas here actually you're playing against a fixed opponent. Um, so there's a little bit of sneakiness here where instead of imagining that you're playing every move uh, when it's your opponent's turn in your, in your planning phase, you need to actually ask your opponent, oh, how would you have played at, at this point in time? Um, so yeah, they find an interesting uh, exploit uh, where they trick the they they are able to trick the opponent into passing and losing the game. And the way this works is here you would say, well, white is probably winning, right? Uh, so white more or less controls all of this territory. Black only controls this small territory here. Um, but unfortunately, according to the rules of Computer Go, um, this counts officially as contested territory, whereas this counts as clearly belonging to black. So if, you, if black can trick the white agent into passing and then pass themselves, when you have two players pass consecutively in Go, um, that, that leads to the game being over, uh, well then, then black will actually win in this setting officially according, according to the rules of computer Go. Um, okay, so the, the authors got a little bit of pushback after doing this. People were saying, okay, well, this is just like an intricacy, like a, 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 a triviality of the rules of computer Go. This isn't really an interesting adversarial attack, right? And so the author said, okay, well, we're, we're going to make our agent resistant against this. We're not going to let the agent pass unless it's completely sure that it's winning. And then they trained some more using this, this, this uh, um, adversarial training uh, approach. And they actually find another really interesting exploit this time. Um, so the way it works is based on creating a cycle of weak stones right here. And so here you can see white is in a very weak position um, because these stones can easily be captured by black. But then over time, and, and so black says, okay, you know, I, I own that area. This game's going to be easy. I'm going to focus on more important areas of the board. Uh, but then over time, white sneakily inserts stones ar around this cycle and is able to capture by having stones on the inside and the outside of the cycle uh, before black, who remember is a strongly superhuman AI you know, algorithm, uh, before black is able to realize what's going on and then the white can have a, a crushing victory. Actually, black resigns lost game, games lost this way, um, but it actually doesn't make you robust against this type of attack. If you train the adversary just a tiny bit longer, um, it will fall again to this type of attack. And the, the guess is that it actually has to do with the model architecture, not with the training data. Um, so Catago, like AlphaZero, like AlphaGo, uses a convolutional neural net, um, which has a little kernel, convolutional kernel, that, that uh, s slides around the image, uh, sort of recognizing local features. Um, but this isn't very good at counting around the board. This is the same reason that AIs are not that great at giving people the right number of fingers, for example, um, when, when they generate images. And so the, the guess is that you'd actually have to change the convolutional kernel size um, and retrain, retrain the model from scratch in, or, in order to address this issue. Um, I think I'm going to skip the comment on my research. And if people are interested, I can talk a little bit about it in question time if there's any time for questions. Uh, and just go to the conclusion, which is that we want to make sure AI goes well, uh, robustness both of current models and in training of future models is one key part of this. seems likely. Uh, it's hard to know. Uh, so OpenAI, for example, has done 
a somewhat decent job at robustifying ChatGPT to simple jailbreaking uh, approaches, at least. Uh, they still fail catastrophically to slightly more intricate attacks or AI-assisted attacks. Um, so it seems likely that this issue is here to stay. But it's also possible that becoming adversarially robust is solved as you make your models bigger and train them for longer. You know, there might, like we saw with the phase, phase transitions for scratch pad use earlier on, there might just be a phase transition in being able to defend against most attacks. We, we don't really know. So I would say it's likely, especially if you are also allowed to increase the compute you put behind an attacker, not just a defender, that, that adversarial exploitability is here to stay. But we, we just don't know at this point. Yeah? I'm curious about your take on the comparison of private sector and academia in terms of producing effective <laughs> AI. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, AI safety is not something that's been taken seriously by companies or academics historically. Um, I think people were wary of talking about things in a science fiction-y way and getting ridiculed by their peers or, in worst case, even like losing funding or something because they're sounding like disconnected from reality. So it's only been in recent years that, that people have started talking about this more, uh, both in academia and in industry. I think the industry approach is, is very like economic incentive driven in most cases, right? So we want to align the system insofar as it's helpful to solving the task at hand. Um, but I wouldn't count on the AI capabilities companies, say, like DeepMind, or I would argue to some extent OpenAI, certainly Google, certainly Meta. Uh, they don't really have much of an incentive to work on bigger safety problems or ensure that things don't go 